my warm-ups are always just kind of doing a mental check of my body, like what's tight, what's what's pulling on me, what's not pulling on me, how do I loosen it up, how to get things going. And um, my body felt a little, little stiff. I remember getting loosed up, getting going, and then finally in the game, kind of working myself into a lather. Um, my body felt good. I had never worked so much in my entire career in terms of preparation and, and getting my body physically ready night in and night out. And um, I've been playing some of my best basketball. always try to do through injuries is not think about them because when the game itself is more significant than the injury you don't feel the injury the injury won't get in the way because it's not important to you As soon as I made the move, I knew it. It feels like the shock absorbers in the back of your foot are just gone. There's just nothing there. So when you walk, it's like, it feels like your calf muscle is touching the floor. <laughs> I could feel it rolling up the back of my calf as if it was just kind of slipping up further and further. I remember feeling the silence. I remember feeling the fear. 35 years old, 17, 18 years in the league. I'm like, this could be a wrap. And that's what the silence was. It was like, this could really be a wrap for you. and our daughters and um, you know I'm already you know I've been crying and uh, um, well, I had tears in my eyes I don't think I was crying yet um, I was more upset like this could be the end in the locker room on the court around my teammates I've always tried to be very strong and be invincible. Not be Clark Kent, but be Superman. And then your family comes in and now that is home. That's where you can be you. 
and um, and I just let it go. I mean, I did. I couldn't. I couldn't hold on to it anymore. You know. And you don't. You know. Looking at um, my daughter's faces. I mean, they they were genuinely afraid, right? Because they never. They could feel something. They could feel the tension, but didn't really know exactly why. And you know, as a parent, the first thing that comes to your mind is when you see your kids afraid, you want them to not be afraid, right? You want to give them strength. You want to give them courage. You want to reassure them. And the only way I could reassure them is by telling them, hey, daddy's OK. You know, it's going to be all right. You know, it's a little setback, but we'll be fine, right? Um, you know, this is what we talk about all the time. You know, you have a bump, bump in the road, you fall, you get back up, and you go after it again, right? That's, um, that's what we do. And so even at the time, I didn't believe it myself. Um, I felt like it was important to say that to them because I, I felt they needed to hear that. And as a parent, you can't just talk the talk. You gotta, you gotta walk the walk. And you gotta be brave. Uh, and uh, uh, in these type of situations, if not for yourself, then for your kids. This injury was Mount Everest for me personally because I knew what the long road was going to be. So, you know, at, at that point, you have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. Oh, it looks beautiful. It goes up there, it goes down below. Can I have a suture removal? It's fabulous snow swelling, huh? Nice tension in it. Yeah, great tension. Kobe, the tension is just perfect. It is? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Can you feel me, can you, can you feel me touching you here? Yeah. That's sterile nerve. Yeah. Yeah. Even uh, his healing is. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's got good healing capabilities there. Yeah, he doesn't have any burning there, so it's so great. And he's got this medial nerve. This looks absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Ross, if you can just hold that. and open up the cling. Point your whole foot up towards the ceiling. And that's it. And relax. And up. Hold, push it up. Just hold it up there. Hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. Now go ahead and move your finger. Let him hold it himself. And let it relax. Wow. 
shut these naysayers up once and for all. <laughs> sore from playing, you know, so uh, he would have his kids walk on his back, which I thought was really fun, trying to stand on your father's back and you're like, you're cracking his back as you're walking on top of him. I always thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, he used to walk on his hamstrings and stuff. He was a ball handling guard at 6'10 that could shoot the long ball. And uh, he had all the skills. He had all the skills. Fans loved him. You know, he could do virtually anything. So he played in the NBA for eight years and decided if he wanted to further his career and play the way he wanted to play, he should make the transition to play overseas and play in Italy. So he took us with him. I was six. And at six, you know, you just go with the flow. You move into a place where you don't speak the language at all. You have friends there, and now after two years, you bounce to another city. Now you have to start again. And then two years later, repeats itself. Two years later, that repeats itself. Now you really don't know anybody, and you have to figure things out all over again. I would be more than happy just to tag along, just to be around that atmosphere, and be around the game, and be a ball boy, and you know, just kind of be in the mix. I would sit under the basket the entire game and I'd have one of those big like sweeper, like court sweeper things. Uh, something happened on the court, somebody slipped with some sweat. I was really anal about making sure I got every little, every last drop up. It was a rush to be that close. I used to try to sleep with my clothes on. You know, if you needed to get to practice, I didn't want to feel like I was gonna make them late or something. I mean, they would do like two practices a day and that sort of stuff. And I'd want to go, I begged to go, but he wouldn't let me go. So I would disappear and go play basketball. The thing that was always the most constant was the game. And that was my refuge. That was the place where I could go and have complete familiarity, no matter where I was, whether it was Rieti or Reggio Calabria or Reggio Emilia or Pistoia. Didn't matter. Whether I got along with the kids or didn't get along with the kids, didn't matter, because I always had my ball. So I can always pick up my basketball, I can always hop on my bike, I can always go to the park, and I can always shoot, right? And um, that gave me a great source of comfort. mom's father, Grandpa Cox, used to uh, record all the games. And uh, he used to box them up and send us copies of them. And I would sit there at home and watch these games over and over and over and over and over and over and over. I saw the NBA game. I saw other players around me. Everybody was there, and I could see it as clear as day. It was a place that I could go to and, and not be alone. I 
I remember I realized that I had to learn how to go coast to coast because that's what John Battle from the Atlanta Hawks did. John Battle, like, you know, most people probably don't know who John Battle is, but I do because from watching him get a rebound, go coast to coast with his left hand, even though he was right-handed, whoa, I need to do that. I wanted to do what those guys do on TV. You know, it was like this mythical thing. The game for me has always been about passion until probably about the age of, age of 13. So it was all about kind of love, it was fun. You know, I went out and played and just, you know, I had a good time. But once we moved back to America for good, when I was 13 years old, um, I kind of moved in about November or so in the school year at Ballard Kenwood Middle School. And I was, just, it was different. I mean, I, I didn't understand the slang. I was a little Italian boy. I didn't understand the fashion. And I couldn't spell. So the teacher told my mother that I was probably dyslexic. It was like somebody took me and dropped me in a bucket in a tub of ice cold water because it shocked the shit out of me. I didn't know anybody. Very awkward, skinny looking, barely spoke. Sitting at a lunch table all by myself, no friends. And I was upset that I had moved. And I had all this you know, resentment and anger inside of me that I hadn't really let out. It was never viewed as, I'm going to control this thing. It was more like, you know what? I'm just gonna delay the eruption. I'm just gonna push it to the side and then use it to my benefit for what it is that I love doing, which is playing the game.
And once I discovered that, everything about the game changed. Because now I understood that I could really lose myself through the game. And no matter what affected me, no matter what happened in life, um, I could always step on the basketball court and let my game speak to that. Step on that court and just absolutely erupt. And that feeling of playing with that rage was new to me, but I fucking loved it. There's a choice that we have to make as people, as individuals. If you want to be great at something, there's a choice that you have to make. We all can be uh, masters at our craft, but you have to make a choice. What I mean by that is um, the inherent sacrifices that come along with that. Family time, hanging out with your friends, being a great friend, right? Being a great um, 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 son, nephew, whatever the case may be. There's sacrifices that come along with making that decision. I want to learn how to become the best basketball player in the world. And if I'm going to learn that, I got to learn from the best. And kids go to school to be doctors or lawyers or so forth and so on, and that's where they study. That's the place for them to study. My place to study is from the best. I knew that I was not going to be stopped. You know, so at the age of 18, this was my life, right? So you can't possibly become better than me because you're not spending the time on it that I do. Even if you want to spend the time on it, you can't because you have other things. You have other responsibilities that are taking you away from it. So I already won.
Growing up in Italy, I was such a big Laker fan, like a massive Laker fan. Like I, I knew everything about them. I was obsessed with magic. Um, I used to work on my skyhook every single day, and then, you know, to be like Kareem, and uh, and then I worked on the baby hooks to be like Magic, and uh, I worked on my runners. Um, to be like James Worthy, my left hand hook runners, right hand hook runners, and my pull up jump shot in transition like Byron Scott, and um, scoring 40, 50, 60 points, 80 points. I'd have those dreams. And so 100% uh, of the time when I imagined these things, I had on a Laker uniform. This was like dream come true. All season, I was just waiting and waiting for my opportunity to come. I wanted to prove that I was better than they thought I was. You know, I wanted to prove to myself that I'm better than they think I was. And I was mentally preparing myself and visualizing the moment that would come where, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I lead the Los Angeles Lakers to a victory. There were times I'd sit the bench for seven straight games and then play the last 20 seconds of a game and then look around and see other players around the league that are out there playing and performing and setting the league on fire. I knew I could play with these guys because I had seen them up close. I knew I could compete with them, but I wasn't getting the opportunity to show it. One of the things that I always used to do is get in my car and drive around the campus of UCLA. And I'd see kids hanging out in fraternity houses and just walking around. I just wanted to feel that. You know, I just wanted to feel that. And then I'd even wonder, fuck, did I make the wrong choice, man? Did I fuck up? I could be going to college and laughing and hanging out with these kids, man, and having a good time and enjoying it. But no, here I am. Before each series, we got a binder and it had all the plays and the players and the statistics. And I, I mean, I really, I studied it. Like, I really studied it. And I didn't know most of the players took the books and, you know, just kind of left them in their rooms or whatever. I, I really studied them. Like, I knew the sets. I knew the percentages. I knew, you know. And uh, I just tried to be as prepared as possible because this was like, I didn't want to mess up.
just gonna keep on going, no matter what. I mean, you fail 10 times, that 11th time is gonna be great. It's not the 11th time, I mean, the 12th time is gonna be great. But eventually, it's gonna happen. We flew back to LA that night, and I got home. It was probably like three in the morning. And I went down to the high school, which is down the street from our house. And the janitor let me in the gym, and I shot all day. All day. I mean, all day. And this was right after that playoff game. And um, I didn't leave the gym. I just kept shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and practicing and practicing. And uh, I got a chance to let out the steam of disappointing my teammates and millions of fans. I got a chance to let all that out instead of bottling it up and envision that moment over and over and over and over and over. That, that was a huge summer for me because I, I I felt like everybody had ripped me off after those air balls. And I was really excited when the schedule came out and I saw we had Utah. I came through really big in the clutch, really big in the clutch. And I remember just feeling like, feeling really like vindicated. Like for me, it was a really big deal. For the veterans, they probably didn't give a shit about it. It was just another regular season game. But for me, it was a big deal. most important thing is you must put everybody on notice that you're here and you're for real. I'm not a player that's just going to come and go. I'm not a player that's going to make an all-star team one time, two times. I'm here to be an all-time great. Once I've made that commitment and said I want to be one of the greatest ever, then the game became everything for me.
like that scene in the movie where everything just magically happens the right way. Everything was, was, was clicking. You know, playing the best basketball in my career, the physical aspect, the mental aspect, um, starting my family, everything's just rolling. championship and uh, kind of being like, well, okay, now what? So wait, what happens now? What happens now? Holy shit, that champagne burns like a motherfucker. <laughs> All right, let's celebrate. Let's, you know, wave the champagne bottles around. Just don't drop it. <laughs> you know, seriously, there is somebody if you drop it. And then outside of that, it was like, okay, now what? choice and say, come hella high water, I'm going to be this, then you should not be surprised when you are that. It should not be something that's, that feels uh, intoxicating or out of character because you had seen this moment for so long, you have played in your mind for so long that when that moment comes, it's like, it's, of course it's here because it's been here the whole time, because it's been up here the whole time. That's what it feels like, at least for me. <laughs> Just having an exorcism. Is it no, it feels a lot better. Anywhere else? Anywhere else, stretch? No. When I wake up in the morning, though, it's tight, right? Right at the attachment of the tendon and the calcaneus. Down there? Yep. Yeah, I don't even know how to spell calcaneus, but I know what the, I know what the fuck it is. <laughs> uh, you gotta be able to communicate what the hell's wrong with you. Those 
those that don't know, I, yes, I had, I had a, a budding music career uh, as a rapper. It, uh, um, it didn't last long, uh, but I did make a video. And uh, on the video set is where I first met Vanessa. I wasn't some big time basketball player at the time either. So it was like, you know, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> It was a two-day video shoot, and uh, I was always looking for her. Like, I wanted to know where she was. And I would finish the take and then go to my trailer, but I wonder where she is the entire time, and then come out of the trailer and just want to talk to her some more in between takes and stuff like that. And uh, she wrote a phone number down at the time where you had to still write phone numbers down. And uh, I called her the very next day, and we talked for hours. She was just beautiful. We literally did everything together, everything together. And I thought I was a big dork because I loved, uh, I loved Disneyland. <laughs> I loved the Disney movies and things like that, but I never really had a chance to go to the park much. And she was a big Disney fan too. And we used to hang out at Disneyland. We used to go to Magic Mountain. She became my best friend. You know, and uh, for me, it was it was very different to have somebody that that I was so close to because I had been so used to growing up in in, uh, in isolation, really, and, and moving around from place to place and uh, making new friends all the time. So I, I never really opened up to anybody because I knew I was just going to inevitably move. Um, but now, you know, being in Los Angeles and feeling like I'm going to be a Laker for the rest of my life, and I just met this beautiful woman that I just see the world the same way with. We decided to uh, to get married. I proposed, she said yes. We're both so young, right? So I'd wake up and I'd go train and I'd come back and she'd still be in the bed sleeping like 18 year olds do, man. She'd be sleep till like 12, one o'clock in the afternoon, man. <laughs> and then I'd lay down with her and I'd go to sleep again too. And then, uh, you know, we'd wake up and just you know, do what kids do. Do what kids do. We we I take her to the batting cage. We go hit some balls. Like you know, we play uh, miniature golf. You know, we go to the movies. Uh, we go out to eat. It was just it was a beautiful time, man. When we had Natalia. It was like such a beautiful moment. Because we, we were starting our own family. And I found so much enjoyment in just being with our baby girl. You know, it was great. And you putting together the nursery and, you know, the crib and you know, all those weird baby Einstein, baby Mozart videos where you're kind of just hypnotizing your kid. <laughs> like, we went through all of that. Um, all that stuff, and, and um, when you're young, you really have the tendency to think about your own personal journey. And uh, for us, it was about taking two young people and trying to figure out our journey together and try to grow together, which is a challenge. But when you have a kid, then it becomes even bigger than that because now you have responsibility of uh, this little life that you have to mold. Going through this time made me ask a lot of questions. Um, and really try to figure out what's important in life.
and what's, uh, you know, everything that I've kind of been holding uh, as significant, you know, the championships and the endorsements and um, maybe that's not the most important thing. Because I lost sight of what is the most important thing, and that's family. It's a man's job to protect your family. It's a man's job to look out for your family. It's a man's job to always be the anchor of stability for the family. And uh, in that aspect, I failed miserably. I'd wake up in the morning and not know if like today is the day where I like I lose my family. Like, is this the day where it's a wrap? You know, I'm like, you know, she's just had enough. One of the things that she said, she said, you know, um, during that time, I, you know, I hated your guts, but it wasn't it wasn't about you. you know, it was about it was about Natalia. It was about the fact that. I, I didn't want. I wanted to do everything possible to try to figure this thing out because I didn't. I didn't want her growing up in a in a broken home, and uh, things would have been really easy for her to to leave, actually. Especially during that time, it'd been much easier to leave. You leave, you take half the money, and you have your daughter. Life's life's. She's good. Um, but she didn't do that. We were uh, expecting, and um, um, expecting our second child during that time, and um, there was just so much, uh, so much stress. Um, she actually, uh, she, you know, she uh, um, actually miscarried, and um, you know. And, uh, you know, it's something uh, I, have a, I have a real hard time dealing with that, you know, because I felt like it was just my fault. You know what I mean? Like we should be building our family, you know, because of my mistake. Because because it's a tough year, um, we're not um, you know we lost a we lost a baby you know, and um, um, it's uh, We uh, try to justify the fact that you know it's uh, you don't know, realize how uh, how common miscarriages are and like you know these things happen and like um, you know it's part of the process, um, but the reality is it happened because of me. You know, not, that's the reality of it, you know. That's something I have to, that's something I have to deal with. That's something I gotta carry forever. Two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, I would drive, I'd leave the house and I'd go to the park. And I'd just sit at midcourt. I just sit there. I was sitting on the basketball. Um, I, and I was just looking up. I was looking up at the stars. I was looking up at the basket and just kind of looking around. And, um, and then I saw myself. I saw myself, eight-year-old self, sitting in front of me on a ball. And then I thought, whoa. 
what would I say to me? Knowing now all the pain that I would go through. Um, my family would go through. I don't, I don't know if I'd keep playing the game. In 2003, I went from a person that was at the top of his game, had everything coming, to a year later having absolutely no idea where life is going. If I'm going to be able to even be a part of life as we all know it. I hear everything that the crowd is saying, and I hear, um, I hear it. So it's like this place where it was my refuge is now being bombarded with um, all kinds of things that they would say. And uh, I had to separate myself, because going through that, that time, I felt like there's so many things coming at once. It was just becoming very, very confusing. I had to organize things. So I created the Black Mamba. So Kobe has to deal with these issues, the, um, all the personal challenges. The Black Mamba steps on the court in does what he does. I mean, it was just, fuck everyone. I'm destroying everybody that stepped on the court. frustration that I just I needed to let out. It 
was an avalanche, man. And, you know, I, there was nothing that was going to get in the way. There was nothing that was going to stop me. It's the battle that's going on within me that I'm carrying with me to these competitions. So it's not about you. It's not about anybody else. You're not making me go. I, I'm, I'm driving this thing, man, and you just so happen to be a person that's in a way that's, you know, that may get demolished in the process. I wanted to prove to myself that I could win under a you know, different role, so to speak. Looking at these incredible teams that have been assembled, and there's always you know, a, a dynamic duo. And when that duo went separate ways, um, one was never able to win without the other. And I just felt like it was really important for myself, and you know, as well as for, for the challenge from others, is to prove that I can, I can lead this team my way. I can put my DNA on the team and and carry them to a championship. naturally assholes. And we ran into a team that was that. They were just much, much tougher, much, much meaner, much nastier. And they whooped us pretty good. I overcompensated for how I drove my teammates. It was um, thinking maybe I was too hard on them. And so throughout the course of the year, I didn't challenge them enough. It was just about not being this gregarious, put my arm around you even when you fuck up. Oh, you're doing great, you're doing great. That's just not me. I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go down my way and leading my way. And this team is gonna have my personality, they're gonna have my grit, they're gonna have my fight, they're gonna have my will, my competitive spirit. And um, so when we step on that basketball court, you're not facing me and just my competitive fire, but you're facing you know, 12 of those. Um, and the challenge became, how do I get that done?
for me, it is that ferocity or that anger, rage, and I can carry that with me. Now it became, you know, how do I instill this to the rest of my guys, to the rest of my teammates? Using the darker emotions, the anger or resentment or frustration and um, sadness, and, and using that as a weapon, using that as, uh, as a form of offense. It's a scar. It's pain, it's a bad memory. That's some people are probably afraid to tap into that side of them, but it's such a powerful thing. Once they own it themselves, then the sky is the limit because they're going to drive themselves and pull it from who they are and all of their life experiences and things that have motivated them. Now just start driving needling them, right, or pushing They had to embrace the villain nature that's in all of us. They gave them a platform to unleash. Position of losing to these guys in the finals again and knowing what that means as a Laker fan and having watched Jerry West lose to the Celtics over and over and over again in the duel between Magic and Bird and now I am a part of this incredible rivalry and what's going to set about us, this team, is that we lost to the Celtics twice. No, I don't think so.
did that, we have a bond now that unites us forever, forever. We have a bond that'll never be broken because we uh, <laughs> lion looked us in the face and we looked back. <laughs> was not only to win one, but it was to win It's constant stretching, it's constant ice baths, it's constant modalities and massage and um, eating the right things, drinking the right things. Um, it's a lifestyle, you know, it's a full-time commitment. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm no spring chicken, you know, but that's okay. Like, I, can, I can figure my way around it. I can feel the energy in the building, the sounds of the cameras flashing, the smell of the popcorn, I like the sounds of people walking around preparing for the game. You can feel the intensity in the air. There's an energy that you can tap into. It's like a frequency that you can tap into. What time is it? Game time! And once you feel it, then everything becomes you, and you become everything.
I love what I do. And it's as simple as that. There's, there's, I get so much enjoyment from it. It's helped me figure out who I am. It's been my confidant, you know, it's been my best friend, psychiatrist, everything. It's the seed that started everything for me. Everything grew from this ball. Now, when I take off my shoe and I look down at my scar, I see beauty in that. Because I see all the hard work, all the sacrifices. I see that journey that it took to get back to this point of being healthy. And I see the beauty in that struggle. That's what makes it beautiful. Let's see what kind of strength you have here. Go ahead and slip that off. That's where the damage is to your cuff. Let me see you raise it to the side. Don't let me rotate it down. Resist me. Any pain? And keep your elbow pointed out towards me. Now, I want to feel how much pressure you can put, push in on your butt. Good. All right. Good, good, good. OK. <laughs> This dark area here, that's, that's the rotator cuff cable. It's not attaching to bone here. So there's only one direction that this tear is going to go. It's, it, it's going to get worse. This is not going to get better. Um, this tear is a pretty big tear already. Your, your normal daily function, you know, aside from basketball, you know, raising your arm, doing activities of daily living, certainly lifting, lifting your kids, you know, playing around, that sort of thing with the arm in this position is going to, is going to get tougher. I think that this is going to need to be fixed because it will cause a problem for you. Um, and we like to try to fix these things when, when you're younger and the tear is smaller. Um, and what's best for your shoulders is you get it fixed oh soon. God, I just don't know what to do with another fucking nine months or some shit. No, I know. I know. I, and it seems that, you know, with the way your injuries have happened, you, you're, you're, the second part of your season, your off season, has been dominated by rehab and rather than an off season. What point do you feel like you're, you're holding on, holding on, holding on to something that's not there? You know, right? And where, at what point do you, your determination and your drive you know, become unreasonable? 
or something that's just not possible. When do you know? Like, when does that moment happen where you know, you know now is the time to let go? This is the this is the moment to walk away. Like, do you ever truly know that? And I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if you do. I don't know if there's ever a moment that was, which is the right moment. I don't know if that moment ever comes. determines when it's up for you. When we say this cannot be accomplished, this cannot be done, then we are shortchanging ourselves. My brain cannot, it cannot process failure. It will not process failure. Um, because if, if I have to, if I sit there and have to face myself and tell myself, you know, you're, you're, you're a failure, I think that's, that's a worse, that's almost worse than death. 